Hey guys, Frosty Knives here. Today we're going to be taking a look at book three of the Dark Tower series, Dark Tower 3, The Wasteland. First, I want to apologize if I'm a little hoarse and disheveled uh, because I've been sick for the last couple of days. So, cough drop and make sure I don't hack during the review. Anyway, here we are. Plume Edition. Uh, of the Dark Tower 3 the book was published in 1991 and this edition clocks in at at magical number magical number 420 pages paperback edition is uh, pushing 600 and I like the plume editions because these come with uh, color illustrations some cool color illustrations throughout the whole book um, there's a cool picture of the tower um, there's probably about 10 or so uh, different illustrations throughout the whole book and uh, my copy of Wizard and Glass is the same way it comes with you know these photos and illustrations so I've decided as these books um, are getting progressively bigger and more complex now, what I'm going to do, instead of just tell you the plot, and because I tend to ramble, I'm going to read the plot summary of all of the books. As we go through, I'm going to read the summary off of Wikipedia, and then I'll just intersperse a few things as we go along. So, here we go. Um, story begins five weeks after the end of the drawing of the three, almost immediately. Roland, Susanna, and Eddie have moved east from the shore of the Western Sea and into the woods of Outworld. I'm not sure it was actually Outworld. After an encounter with a gigantic cyborg bear named Shardik, whose real name is Mur, M-I-R, they discover one of the six mystical beams that hold the world together. The three gunslingers follow the path of the beam inland to Midworld. Now, just to clarify, um, yeah, this is the first time we start to talk about the purpose of the tower. And the purpose of the tower, and uh, there's actually a drawing in here if I can find it quickly enough. The tower is a linchpin. I don't know if I can find it. It's a linchpin that holds all worlds together. And we find out that there are... Um, I don't think I can find it. That's fine. The center of the tower is the center of all universes, and there are six spokes that that come out from the tower, and these are the beams. And at the end of each beam is a guardian. So there are twelve guardians, and there are six beams. And in the beginning of that in the middle of that spoke of the wheel, there is the tower. And in the beginning, you find Shardik. The bear, who is one of the guardians, this giant cyborg bear who's gone insane after years of um, just being alone and everything running down and the world moving on. So they find it and they realize that they can follow the path of the beam or the bear, the portal of the bear, and follow the path of the beam south, or southeast, I think it is, straight to the tower. So now they have a path. Now they have a way to go. Okay, so they, they fight the bear and they get on the path of the beam and they know that if they can follow the beam, it will eventually lead them through mid-world and into end-world and to the tower. Roland now reveals to his quartet that his mind has become divided by the paradox of having let Jake die under the mountains after finding him at the way station and yet also after having prevented Jake's death in New York City, in the drawing of the three, having an alternate memory of traveling through the desert and mountains alone. So, Roland has created his own paradox. Did he save the boy? Did he not save the boy? Jake, meanwhile, in 1977, Jake Chambers is experiencing the same crippling mental divide. So, both of them remember being alive and then remember him being dead and Roland remembers going through the mountains with Jake and he remembers going through the mountains without Jake 
So they both start experiencing these paradoxes. Uh, Roland burns Walter's jawbone that he has, and the answer and the key to Jake's dilemma is revealed to Eddie Dean, not Roland. And Eddie must carve a key that will open a door to New York in 1977. So he takes a piece of... The, uh, Roland burns the bone, the jawbone. It shows the impression of a key. Eddie sees it, and he grabs a piece of ash tree, and he starts carving the key. Jake, in a schizophrenic panic, abruptly leaves school. After purchasing a children's book called Charlie the Choo Choo, he actually purchases two books, Charlie the Choo Choo and a book of riddles called Riddle Dee Dumb, at a used bookshop called, owned by a man named Calvin Tower, who will become very important later in the books, Jake finds a key in a vacant lot where grows a single red rose. So he leaves school, he rushes through, he buys these two books, he's in this weird daze, he gets into this lot, and he finds a key. And he finds a single rose and a purple blade of grass. And when he looks into the rose, he sees all suns, the suns of all the universes. He hears the voices, and he sees pretty much all of existence in the rose. And we come to find out later in the books that that rose is how the tower looks in Jake's world. So that rose is actually the tower. And they realize later on they have to protect it. But this is the first time we see the rose. Um, so eventually, Jake is able to pass into Roland's world using a key that he found to open a door in an abandoned haunted house on Dutch Hill that they call the mansion. The portal between the mansion and Roland's world ends in a speaking ring in Roland's world. During the crossing over, Susanna has sex with the demon of the speaking ring to keep it from attacking Eddie. Once the group is reunited, Jake's and Roland's mental anguish ends. Roland has now completed the task of bringing companions into his world, which he started with the drawing of the three. Following the path of the beam again, the Kotep befriends an unusually intelligent Billy Bumbler, which they call Oi, and he joins them on their quest. So now... The content is complete. We got Roland, we got Jake, we got Eddie, we got Susanna, and we got Oi, the Billy Bumbler. And just a little side note, when it says that Susanna has to have sex with the demon of the speaking ring to keep it from attacking Eddie so that Eddie can draw Jake in, this is the first, during this book, this is we start to find, find out for the first inklings that Susanna thinks she might be pregnant. That becomes important too. Uh, in a small, almost deserted town called River Crossing, Roland is given a silver cro cross and a courtly tribute by the town's last ancient citizen. So they're walking down the path of the beam. They've got everybody. They pass through River Crossing. They spend a night or so there. They come to a river called Sen, the Sen River. They come to a bridge, and on the other side of the bridge is the city of Lud. Kotek continues on the path of the beam to Lud. Before arriving at Lud, the Kotet hear the drum beats from the song Velcro Fly, which they call the, the God Drums, by ZZ Top playing from the city. Um, later, the drums are revealed as war drums, or God Drums, which Lud citizens fight to. The ancient high-tech city has been ravaged by decades of war, and one of the surviving fighters, a man named Gasher, kidnaps Jake by taking advantage of a near accident the team faces while crossing a decaying bridge that looks like the George Washington Bridge of New York City. Roland and Oi must then, tr must then trace them through a man-made labyrinth in the city and into the sewers in order to rescue the boy from Gasher and his leader, the TikTok Man. Jake manages to shoot the TikTok Man, leaving him for dead. The Kotet is eventually reunited at the Cradle of Lud, a train station which houses a monorail that the travelers used to escape Lud before its final destruction, brought about by the monorail's artificial intelligence known as Blaine the Mono. The ageless stranger, Randall Flagg, man in black, arrives to recruit the badly injured TikTok man as his servant. Once aboard Blaine, a highly intelligent, 
computerized train, which is insane due to system degradation, that announces its intention to derail itself with them aboard unless they can defeat it in a riddling contest. It's a crazy train that loves to riddle. The novel ends with Blaine and Roland's cotet speeding through the wastelands, a radioactive land of mutated animals and ancient ruins created by something that is claimed to have been far worse than a nuclear war, on their way to Topeka, the end of the road. Blaine's, Blaine's route ends in Topeka, which is an end world. So, that's literally how the story ends. They're on, they're on Blaine the Mono, they're hurtling. It's the biggest cliffhanger in the world. And it ends with them on this riddling contest. And the deal is, if Blaine answers all of their riddles, Blaine will kill himself and everyone aboard. But if they can stump Blaine, then Blaine will bring them to Topeka safe and sound, and then they can do whatever it wants. Um, so, I mean, this is a very well-paced book, a very fast-paced book. And there's a lot of, we start to get a lot of explanation about Roland's world and the purpose of the tower and how everything is interconnected. Um, I really like the fight with Shardik. I really like looking back into Roland's world and seeing how the, the, the images of how Roland's world u- used to be compared to what it is now. I like the concept of the beams and the guardians and the, the, the purpose of the tower. And the purpose of Roland, we find out that Roland finally says that the tower is sick. There's a sickness in the tower. That's why all the worlds are being infected. And he's going to the tower to fix it. We have a a full quartet now. And there's lots of things that have been laid in place for future novels. I've heard people say the middle of the book is a bit draggy because of the river crossing thing. But I don't think so. Because the beginning of the book, the first part of the book, there's a battle. The end of the book, there's a battle. So that middle river crossing part, sort of the lull before the storm. We kind of have a down, you know, we have a downbeat before we go back to to, um, to, to the, the big battle in Ludd. Um, one of the things that the Wikipedia page didn't tell you was that before Blaine left Ludd on his road to Topeka, he gassed the entire city of Ludd. So there were thousands and thousands of people in that city, and Blaine gassed them all, killed them, killed the entire city, um, and left. Uh, Blaine is quite insane. Um, He's just an insane talking mono. I've heard a lot of people say they didn't like the character of Blaine, but but I do. This, This idea of technology gone bad, of technology gone so corrupt and crazy that it's like Skynet. You know, what happens when technology turns on you, on its creators? And we kind of get that. Um, Having read this when it first came out, I have to tell you, um, it ends on a cliffhanger. And, oh my God, it's it's such a shitty way to end a book on a cliffhanger. Who ends a book on a cliffhanger? And then we had to wait years for Wizard and Glass to come out. Four, Four years, maybe. Three, four years. It felt like an eternity. And we're all sitting here going, what, what, what are they going to do? So the ending of the book, the fact that it ends on a cliffhanger, that could be, a, that could be a, a downside for people. And according to the afterword, it was a downside to Stephen King. And he was like, hey, don't blame me. That's how the book ends. So, um, you know, that could be a downside. But fortunately for us, all the Tower books are out now, so we can just keep reading. There's really no down. Really no downtime to it. But boy, when this thing first came out, and I got to the end, and I went, oh my god, what now? Now I gotta wait how long? We didn't know when the next book was coming out, and we just had to wait forever. So, um, that was more of a topical. It's not so much an issue anymore. It was back then. Uh, but I really enjoyed this book. This is probably my next favorite after, after Drawing of the Three. It's my next favorite. And I'm gonna give this one five out of five, because I think just like Blaine the Mono, King was really starting to pick up speed with this book. The next book is Wizard and Glass. And it's one of the books that I don't dread. But a large chunk of it is Roland's backstory, which is fine. But Roland's, but Roland's backstory is a love story. So Wizard and Glass is really a love story. 
could be hard to get into. And it's long. It's really long. Um, but I like the characters in this. I like the way they brought Ro uh, Jake into the world. I like the, the, the evil haunted house that tried to kill Jake and eat him. And Roland having to pull him through into Midworld. I like Blaine the Mono. I like the fact that the, the, the citizens of Lud are killing each other over Velcro Fly. It's, it's funny. Um, they're, they're killing each other. As Eddie Dean actually says in the book, they're killing each other over, over a song that was never even a single. I, I, I love that. I love that whole description. Um, so, I highly recommend reading this book. And I'll come back again after I finish reading Dark Tower number four. Wizard in Glass, as always, like, subscribe, thumbs up, share it with people. Hope you enjoyed this series, and we'll, we'll catch you again.